University. I'm also the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's uh, good to get a chance to chat with you both, albeit virtually. Um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is that we'll go around and allow uh, my colleagues that are also teaching in the Environmental Science and Policy Program, I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, then it'll turn back to me, and I'll give you just a broad overview of the Environmental Science and Policy Program. Uh, at that point, I may have to excuse myself. I have to take my youngest daughter to her kindergarten orientation registration session tonight. Uh, but uh, my colleagues will be able to take over uh, and answer all of your questions about the program uh, and they'll be able to uh, show you a number of pictures of students in the program engaged in uh, uh, deep experiential learning opportunities related to ecological restoration, species conservation, sustainability, uh, water quality, uh, and habitat assessments. Um, if at any point during the course of this presentation uh, either one of you would like to ask us a direct question, feel free to interrupt using the chat bar that you'll see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Michael uh, just uh, typed over here for you so that you have an opportunity to see that. At any point, you all can chime in. After we're done introducing ourselves, we'll give you an opportunity to maybe type a little bit about yourselves into that chat box so we can get a chance uh, to learn a little bit about each of you. So uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Keith Somerville. My PhD is in zoology. I am an animal conservation biologist. Uh, in the program, I teach uh, most of my courses uh, using outdoor laboratory experiences and hands-on sampling of both plants and animals. I teach conservation biology, uh, restoration ecology, entomology, mammalogy, uh, tropical ecology, uh, and, and some other niche classes that deal with upper level uh, population dynamics, modeling, uh, and community uh, conservation. Michael? I'm Michael Renner. I'm a professor in environmental science and psychology and biology because I can't figure out where I fit. Um, my courses are mostly in animal behavior. My PhD was in uh, biological psychology, so I teach animal behavior and primatology and animal behavior methods. I also teach nature photography. And I will be taking a group of students to Rwanda in January of 2016 and probably every couple of years after that. David? Yeah, hi. Um, Katie, if you had a chance, if you could just type something in the chat so we understand that, that things are working for you, that'd be great. Um, anyway, I'm Dave Card Howery. I, uh, my doctorate's in, um, in physical chemistry and I have a master's in public affairs, so I kind of uh, am our policy science guy. I kind of, oh, thank you very much. Um, I kind of uh, straddle the fence there. I teach our introductory class uh, and also a class on climate, on um, uh, ecological economics, and some of our later modeling class and things like that. Um, we also have uh, a professor who's not able to be here, um, but who does hydrology and, and those types of things. And then we have a number of professors who um, who we work with in other departments. So we're all in environmental science and policy. We also have a number of professors in, say, biology um, uh, and uh, you know, politics and sociology and history that, that teach environmental science classes or environmental policy classes. Um, I also, uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, he, you know, he brings students to Rwanda. I bring students. Alternatively, we're on in 2016. We go to we're going to Belize, uh, and then 2017, uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos, and we alternate every other year. Ben, why don't you uh, go ahead use that chat window, and why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, in particular, what interests you about environmental science? Our goal is to. Um, or I'll go here is to let you guys know what, what it is that you're curious about to answer, answer those kind of questions. So, um, you know, we can tell you about, about the program, about Drake, uh, the, the area here. Uh, Katie, also, if you want to jump in, feel free. Be really typing. <laughs> I... Ah, very good. Okay. Um, and then, you know, Katie, I've talked to you a couple of different times. Um, 
most recently last week. So I have some good sense for where your interest areas lie. Um, let me explain to you just a little bit about the program um, from a kind of macro scale. Uh, and then um, we'll drill down into the specifics as we, as we go along. Like I said, we got a lot of pictures to show you. Michael's going to start scrolling through some of them uh, as I talk over this. Um, the Environmental Science and Policy Program uh, consists of two different majors. Uh, students have the opportunity to major in either environmental science or major in environmental policy. Uh, many times students pursue both paths uh, without having to make a decision or choose between one or the other as being more or less interesting um, uh, over the course of their four years here. Within the environmental science major, we have two different tracks that students can pursue. Uh, one of the tracks is more aligned with the uh, plant and animal side of, of faculty expertise. That track is called conservation biology. Uh, and the depth of, of experiences that you can have within that track uh, are organized around ecological theory uh, and then the application of that ecological theory uh, for uh, three different um, uh, uh, levels of biological organization. And those levels of biological organization could be different species groups, plants, mammals, fish, reptiles, amphibians, insects, you know, what have you. Or those levels of biological organization could be more um, macro and scale. So we have field specialty courses in limnology, which is the study of lakes and streams. We've got field specialty courses in ecosystem ecology, in population um, uh, and demographic modeling and population ecology. We have courses in ecological restoration, in geomorphology, in hydrology. So depending on your particular area of interest, um, invasive species, for instance, then you'd be taking a good deal of botany and probably some ecosystem and restoration ecology as a way of taking that concern that you've got for effects of human on the environment, translating that into a curriculum that moves you closer towards uh, an employment opportunity or a graduate opportunity post-graduation. Uh, the other track that we offer is a little bit more rooted in the physical sciences. It's a track that involves um, hydrology and geology. Uh, students in that program spend a little bit more time uh, on the chemistry and the physics side of the world. If you're interested in environmental engineering, uh, the, the, the hydrology, geology track has the core uh, intro to physics courses and some of the intro to mathematics courses that are appropriate for somebody thinking about um, you know, post-baccalaureate engineering careers. Uh, but we also have classes in that more physical science track that are uh, explicitly um, modeling-based uh, water uh, geochemistry uh, based and then a little bit of, of hydrodynamics and, and hydrogeology. So for the student that isn't necessarily as interested in the plant and animal side of the house, but is more interested in what really is the number one environmental issue facing the Midwestern United States, that's water, we have that track established for you uh, within the environmental science major as well. Uh, the environmental policy major is a little bit different. Uh, the area of emphasis in our policy major is more social sciences and humanities oriented. Uh, the specific outcomes uh, that students um, will, will touch upon in the environmental policy program have to deal with understanding the historical, sociological, and political uh, uh, underpinnings of environmental problems, um, as well as developing some, some of the basic policy analysis and recommend problem solving skills associated with, with evoking change uh, uh, on, the, on the policy landscape as it pertains uh, to, to in environmental issues. So those are our, the two majors that we have in the program and then also the two tracks within the major. One of the things that I've also found that students sometimes confuse uh, as part of understanding just the language of higher ed is that you know you major in something like environmental science at Drake University you can also earn uh, or you are also working towards a degree and that degree is the bachelor's degree and in the environmental science and policy program we offer two different degree options uh, we offer a bachelor's of science in environmental science that bachelor of science degree uh, is contingent upon the completion of Oh, that's your thing. Con contingent upon the completion of one year of research with a faculty member colleague, um, either the th one of the three or soon to be four of us or any of our affiliate faculty. In order to earn that Bachelor of Science degree, you have to do that one year research project. And then you'll present that project at our undergraduate science colloquium uh, in the spring semester of your senior year. If that research thing isn't really your game, we also offer a Bachelor of Arts degree. Um, it's got the same general curriculum minus the research requirement. So it's a little bit different in terms of what your life looks like over the course of a four-year tenure uh, at Drake University. With that, 
I think I've kind of covered the macro scale uh, outlines of what we offer here in the environmental discipline. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Michael, who's going to walk you just through some of the pictures to talk about our, our commitment to experiential learning with an emphasis on the fact that you will spend most of your time outside of the classroom uh, doing more than time inside the classroom, uh, listening to uh, faculty lecture and taking notes. Unmuting helps, helps a lot. There you go. Hi there. Hi there. Um, science is a science verb. Is a verb. It's, it's, something, it's something that you do. So, and so we all believe pretty strongly that if you're going to learn how to be a scientist or to be in the world of science, even if you want to be on the policy side of it, you have to know how it's done. And that means you have to spend time doing it. So a lot of the things that we do in our classes and in our other experiences that we construct for students is to make sure that you're going to get your hands dirty. And so I, I thought I would just take you through some of the experiences that our students have had in the last couple of years. And since these are photographs that have been taken from, from all of our programs and, and projects, I think when we speak to picture comes up, probably each of us should talk about it rather than having me talk about other people's projects. Um, so for example, uh, the Chicago Bottom Greenbelt is a nature area that is being reconstructed into its original form about uh, 25 minutes from campus. And it's one of our main field sites. Um, and I think uh, probably it's Keith would be the best one to talk about that a little bit. Uh, okay, so what you're seeing there is uh, some students that are engaged in looking at how uh, conservation strips associated with row crop agriculture are providing um, ecosystem services from a biodiversity perspective. They're looking at uh, occupancy in those strips of invasive insect species that tend to eat corn, and they're also looking for the presence of native pollinators that would be associated with. Uh, the agricultural landscape. And although corn is a wind pollinated plant, um, the presence of pollinators in the broader landscape is really important for those crop producers in the state of Iowa that are looking to diversify into uh, fruits and more um, uh, bee pollinated um, secondary species. In particular, the honey market is starting to become important, especially in central Iowa. So what you're seeing there are some of my students that are engaged in doing the field work necessary uh, to um, uh, understand uh, the broader uh, agricultural ecosystem. All right, the next shot is one of mine. Um, we're going to jump all the way around the world into equatorial Africa. Um, this is the Kishwati Forest Reserve. It is a remnant of uh, an ancient rainforest uh, right along the equator in the country of Rwanda. Uh, the border you see uh, straight behind the middle person in the picture is actually the border of the reserve. So to the right you see agricultural lands and to the left is, is a reserved area that is in the process of becoming Rwanda's fourth national park. And the project that one of the projects we are working on there, there are several, um, involves the fact that the animals that live in the reserve sometimes come out and treat the cropland um, as their big smorgasbord, and that causes friction with the local farmers. And we are working on trying to figure out what factors predict that crop rating, and then figuring out what we can do to mitigate it. Uh, we're several years into the project now. That's two of our ENSB students who are with me uh, three years ago now. Um, I've taken students there every year for the last four years. And we are testing a model that seems to predict where, pretty well where the chimpanzees will come rate the crops and where they won't. With an idea that we'll be able to propose land use guidelines that would give the farmers a chance to, to use the land, but use it in ways that wouldn't attract the animals out of the reserve to, to rate their crops. OK. Uh, one of the more longitudinal research projects that uh, the Somerville Lab uh, operates is uh, marking um, and doing uh, habitat utilization studies for a variety of different turtle species in the state of Iowa. Um, in this case, you're looking at some students of mine uh, using some very simple um, paint uh, combinations on the back of a, um, ironically enough, painted turtle. Uh, and they're, they're, they're marking them individually so that they can map how they move through uh, the prairie pothole landscape in the, on the eastern part of Polk County. Um, we're using those habitat maps to try to delineate places on the landscape that would be appropriate for uh, wildlife conservation corridors. We also use radio telemetry techniques uh, to come up with more spatially detailed maps of ornate box turtle uh, habitat use. So um, I employ in any particular summer uh, five to seven students in my lab. Uh, the agroecology experiment that you saw two slides back is one example of what students do uh, for employment in the summers. And then this this turtle work is another thing that, that I've got funded out through uh, 2018. 
Uh, and so I, I regularly plug students in through these um, experiential opportunities. Yeah, so this is a picture of the Scrub Garden. Um, and this is actually a project that our seniors uh, got the money for and, uh, and, and made work essentially. So they received a 45,000, they, they applied for and received a $45,000 grant to um, put a community garden in uh, right by Drake's campus. And so uh, what you see here is they're working with Boys and Girls Club to plant uh, some, some fruit trees. There are apple, um, pear, peach, and plum, and some pawpaws in there. So, uh, you know, working with kids to, to learn how, or so, so they can learn you know, how, how, what you can grow here and how you grow it and so on. Then what you can't see is there is a um, relatively large garden right next to that. Well, actually, I guess it hasn't been built yet, that's what the stakes are for. Um, but anyway, there's a relatively large garden nearby. We have, uh, I think it's 12 raised beds, uh, uh, and, and a number of other areas, uh, a shed and a teaching area where we um, where we, we, we bring kids from Boys and Girls Club and some other places to uh, uh, come and work. And it helps it helps us uh, a lot of our students to do to, to, to learn about gardening and uh, food production and a number of other food issues that come up in Iowa. But it's also we we're in a food desert here in um, well mostly to our east where it's hard for a lot of people to get a hold of um, you know, healthy foods. And so this allows us to work with the community to produce some of those and to work with kids so they can learn how to, how to, how to grow those things. Um, and I just think it's exciting because that was an entirely, you know, we, we guided them and, and helped them, but it was an entirely student-led effort. Um, we also, students, th this year we're working on another grant that students got for $65,000 to uh, restore a creek near our environmental learning center. And so what I like about that is that, you know, not a lot of people come out of, uh, come out of college with the ability to say, you know, they, they, they've received, a, they've applied for and received, this, you know, uh, multi-thousand dollar grant. So it's a nice, it's a nice little thing to put on your, on your resume when you're looking for jobs. Uh, so and, and and what you see here is you you see some um, some people working in that creek that we're that we're going to be working on that we're storing this year. Um, next, this is this is a picture from near the top of Mount Pichincha, which is a sixteen thousand foot uh, mountain right outside of Quito that we 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 brought our students um, to or I brought students down to, to um, last year. Uh, and the year before that, where we we spent some time in Quito, Ecuador, uh, which is the happens to be the the highest capital in the world, uh, and we uh, there we talk about issues that are facing Ecuador, some of the some of the drilling for oil in the rainforest, and and some of the indigenous issues and so on. And then we move to the Galapagos, and I think I have some picture down here, um, and there we talk about issues where we uh, issues of um, invasive species of ecotourism and how you how you balance in a, in a poor country like Ecuador how you balance the needs for sustainable economic development but also the needs of conservation in a in a world heritage site like the Galapagos Islands and what you see here then um, I, I would definitely want you to come with us to the Galapagos here we have students who are working on um, invasive species removal and and on the Galapagos Islands invasive species really are the the you know main game um, in town that's that's what uh, is causing the vast majority of the extinct, of the extinctions that we're seeing on the Galapagos um, the you, you clear things differently on the islands than you do here in the Midwest um, we, we use power tools and fire in the Midwest in um, Ecuador you use machetes for everything Michael all right I got it. Helps us out of work. No, that's quite all right. I, I, we're we're, we're going to bounce around because this is way more fun than doing things in a normal way. Um, let me fish for a picture here. I am. There I am. That's, well, that's the one I was looking for. One of the things that we've started adding to our curriculum in the last few years is the idea that managing endangered species is clearly part of, of managing the environment. 
And zoos are becoming an increasingly important part of that as the environmental restrictions around the world and the habitat loss uh, begins to pile up. There are certain species where the zoo is really the, the lifeboat for that species. And so we started uh, last year teaching a course in zoo biology where you learn to, to manage captive animals in ways that reduce their stress and keep them healthier so that eventually we, you know, we, we hope that there'll be breeding programs that would reintroduce them into the wild. So part of managing endangered species is, is learning how to keep track of them and keep them healthy and keep them happy in captivity. So uh, for example, in the zoo biology class, we're behind the scenes um, helping the keepers and learning how the keepers work with the animals behaviorally so that they can participate in their own care. Um, if they know what's going on, if they know what the routines are, you can work with them and, and establish routines where they know what's expected of them and that they will happily cooperate, which is far less stressful than, for example, having to anesthetize them every time you need to do some minor veterinary procedure. So there's there's the picture of working with Deuce, who is our 500-pound four-year-old lion. Um, Deuce doesn't like me very much, so he's usually pretty loud when I'm around, and that's kind of entertaining for the students. Um, another example is uh, back behind the scenes with the in the rhinoceros barn. Um, that's one of the students in the zoo biology class just actually January of this year. Um, and what, one of the perks of doing this kind of work is that occasionally you get to go home and say, I got to pet a rhinoceros today. Um, and that's an awful lot of fun. Um, yeah, one thing that we don't have many pictures of here that, uh, because, because, because it's not, not exciting, exciting as uh, independent uh, rhinoceros, rhinoceros is, but, but um, uh, uh, we feel pretty strongly that, that at Drake you need a mix of knowledge and skills, right? And so some of the skills come from working in the fields, but some of the skills that are also going to get you a job are things like GIS, which is a computer mapping program that allows you to do some pretty neat things and understand spatial issues. Um, and it's in, in, high in high demand, demand and so we find that, that, that students, students who have, have a mix, mix of things, of things like, like field skills, field skills but, also but also some of the computer, computer skills, skills that come from GIS, GIS or, or some of the modeling classes, classes. Um, uh, uh, you, you will definitely leave Drake being an expert in Excel. Uh, so the, the, the skills that come out of those, um, uh, that, that, that kind of training will also help you guys to, to be getting jobs. So that's, I think, um, uh, they, they, they some other students working in uh, Camp Creek. That's out by the Environmental Learning Center, I believe. Um, they are, I think, looking at benthic invertebrates and using that as a way to, and that's what the, the, the net is for, using that as a way to assess the, the quality of the, the habitat, right? So they're essentially looking at looking at what bugs live in the stream and using the, the, the different types of bugs to be able to tell whether it's sort of a healthy stream or not. Um, and that's an important uh, piece in, in trying to figure out what we, what we should be doing in terms of, of um, uh, restoration. And I guess, uh, oh. One what, what of the perks is working in interesting places is sometimes you're close to other things that are pretty interesting. Um, the, the field site we work at in Rwanda is actually literally within sight across the mountaintops of the volcanoes chain that is the Volcanoes National Park that spans Rwanda and Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that's the place that the mountain gorillas live. So I, I had the privilege this last summer of actually going to visit with them and I'm hoping that I'll be able to take students there in January of next year. Um, I, I took that picture in early, actually the end of August. Um, and yes, I was really that close. Um, it, was, it was a fairly extraordinary experience and it puts the importance of protecting the environment into pretty stark relief when you realize that there are 800 of these animals left in the entire world and you just got to meet some of them. Um, from, from the study site in Rwanda where we're working actually, um, there are chimpanzees there as well as several other species of primates and a, and a couple of other relatively unusual species. Um, that's Ruhira from one of the family groups. There's a small group of chimpanzees there and so they are all known as individuals. We have DNA samples on them and are tracking their genetic relatedness to one another as, as the generations move on. Um, moving back to a slightly more local picture, um, th this is actually at the Environmental Learning Center. There are a couple of bodies of water there. Um, it's a, a fairly large site and there are a number of projects going on. And so there are samples that are being taken of various parts of the environment on an ongoing basis so that we have a database to work with so that we can track how that site changes as it's restored to its original condition. Yeah, um, one last thing, and, and probably then we should get to your questions and figure out what you guys want to know. Um, 
Uh, Keith mentioned a little bit, talked a little bit about, about research, and I think you'll find this in a lot of places these days, but certainly at Drake, uh, we feel strongly that, that, a, uh, that, that we want to engage students in act, active research. And so all of us at Drake have active research programs that incorporate students. Um, we, uh, you know, if you want to do some research, you can usually get paid for that. Um, and we're all publishing papers with with students. Uh, some is exciting and often uh, in Rwanda and so on. Others, uh, other um, research projects are, are local and Des Moines. Um, and we have a number of different ways you can get involved in, in research. You can you can uh, take research for credit. You can, like I said, uh, do do um, paid summer research, or you can do uh, research sort of in your spare time. If you just want to kind of get your feet a little wet and figure out what's what's going on, some students, some students you know, you know, just won't, won't want to do it as it maybe in the study study or maybe just on their own during the semester. semester. Um, um, so, so, so that's, so that's a real, a real, unless you have anything to add, Michael. I'll, I'll just mention one other thing because it's a project that Keith and I are doing together. This is this is back in Rwanda. It's a couple of our students again, uh, testing methods of reforestation. Um, part of the Gishwati Forest Reserve actually had been not thoroughly cleared, but the, the forest had been pretty badly damaged in a population influx after a, a civil war in that country a number of years ago. And they're trying to figure out how to reforest it so it can be part of the reserve and, and, and part of the same ecosystem, essentially. So we are testing a method that's actually very simple and very inexpensive of reforesting, starting with the ficus plant, uh, which is an endemic plant there and is, is very important in that ecosystem. It's also a fallback food for many of the animals that live in the reserve. So if you can get the ficus to be growing well, then the animals can populate that area even before the rest of the cover grows in. So the, the, the procedure was actually very simple of taking cuttings of these plants and then sticking them in the ground and seeing if they would, you know, if they would begin to grow as plants. And after one year, the survival rate was actually very good. This is us out on the mountainside tracking down the plants that had been stuck in the ground the year before and measuring their health and vitality. We can get that picture to come up. There you go. You know, how much have they grown? How many leaves do they have? Are they still alive and healthy? Um, and it, the, the project is actually probably going to serve as the basis for reforesting a, a significant part of that reserve. Um, one, one of the nice perks of that is that when you want to work in that area, there actually are no roads within several miles. So you end up parking at the village school and hiking your way in from there. And you're always a big hit when you walk through the village school because they probably haven't seen a Westerner in you know, months at the very least, sometimes since you were there last year. Yeah, and um, uh, I also did some work on, on the project. I worked with a student to develop a model of, of carbon sequestration in the forest so that we could uh, track the, the value essentially of the, of the carbon they were uh, sequestering. And we're looking into now maybe moving some of that research to Belize uh, not not giving up the, the Rwanda piece, but potentially um, getting a, a, a research site, a tropical research site that's that's more available, or easier to get to for for some students. Um, so, uh, Kate, as far as this, whether this is part of the study abroad program, yes and no. So, uh, you know, we talked about. We talked about travel seminars during our January program. Uh, so Jay, Drake has a J term, and it's about three weeks. And so uh, that, that's a way that a lot of students can travel and and uh, you know kind of get get a, a broad experience if they don't want to spend a whole semester. We certainly have a lot of students that that, that spend a whole semester abroad, and they um, and they you know, can get a lot out of that. And we are very flexible in terms of making sure that they get credit for the classes that you're taking abroad so it doesn't get in the way of your, um, of your graduation date or anything like that. Uh, so, so we have the study abroad program like that. And, but then we also have individual students doing research. So the ones you saw there, those were, those were individual students who were uh, over there during the summer. They were collecting data and then they came back here and and analyze that and, and wrote it up. So, so the research isn't necessarily part of the um, study abroad program, but certainly the, the trips that I take, the seminars are all um, service learning based. And so we, we do a lot of the reforestation, uh, working with kids and, um, and invasive species removal, just depending on kind of where we are. 
Drake has a very active study abroad office, and so we, we, we in environmental science really believe that students should have an international experience. It, it's hard to work in the environmental field without seeing things in a global way, and so having that international experience is a really important part of building that perspective. We also are affiliated with the School for Field Studies, which is a, an accredited institution. It's linked to the University of Minnesota. And because of our aff affiliation with that organization, if you go on a School for Field Studies program, you take part of your Drake financial aid with you. And uh, SFS has field sites at, uh, I think it's eight or nine places around the world right now. And I'm a member of their academic advisory board, so I should remember this number, but at the moment it's slipped my mind. Um, they have sites in places like the Turks and Caicos Islands in Panama, in uh, Tanzania, in Australia and New Zealand. And each of those is a site where there is an environmental problem that they are working on. You can go there for an entire semester. You take courses in the language and culture. You take courses in environmental issues. You take courses that, that orient you to the specific issue that that research site is working on. And along the way, you're getting acquainted with the faculty who work at that site. And then the last month you're there, you're actually doing an independent research project. It's a, a really wonderful program. And we actually have several students who have started going on this. Uh, I think there are four or five who are thinking about it for fall of next year. And we, we think it's a wonderful opportunity for our students because it essentially expands our campus into half a dozen places around the world where Drake alone couldn't have that facility. But by working together with others, we, we create the opportunity for students to, to find their niche and find the kind of a research experience that they want to have for their own career plans. Yes, yeah, so what other kinds of things are you guys curious about? What, what would you like to know about Drake as you guys make up your mind about different places and so on? Oh. OK, um, so I should first start out by saying that um, this is what Alex asks, uh, what, what can you do with environmental engineering besides research and studies, such as engineering law and policy? Um, we actually do not offer a specific, specific engineering, engineering degree. degree. Uh, if you uh, want one, we, we, we do have, have a two, two degree, degree program with, with Iowa, Iowa State. State. So you come to come Drake, to Drake uh, and get started. Get started. But if but you want to get, get, if you want to get, get certified, certified as an engineer, engineer then, then you're, you're going to need to um, take, take a chunk, chunk of your classes up at Iowa State or, or another uh, university. So we offer environmental science, um, which is a little bit different than engineering because it, it's engineering is sort of learning how to environmental engineering, especially sort of learning how to build stuff like um, uh, you know, uh, water treatment facilities and so on. Uh, what you can do with our degree uh, is a lot of things. We have students all over the place. So, so, so Alex, Alex, you point, point out law and policy. Yeah, we, we send students to law school. We send students to get MPAs. Um, they work, you know, if you take our policy, if you go in the policy direction, um, we have a lot of students who uh, go into uh, urban planning, for example. So you can get a master's in urban planning after, after this. Um, we also have a lot of students who go directly into jobs in, say, sustainability, in advocacy work. Um, uh, and 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 in, in the like state government in the DNR, that also people from uh, from environmental science also they find often that that they want to go directly either get a job and a career right out of college or else spend a little bit of time in a career out of college, uh, and so they'll also they'll, they'll go work as wildlife or habitat managers, say for uh, you know parks or organizations like. Um, like the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we have students who, again, go to work at, at in, you know, local government or state level government in, uh, in uh, planning, or, sorry, it, from, from the science perspective in, you know, habitat management, environmental management, those kind of things. Uh, we have, we have students, students who go, go work, work in international, international development. development. So that's, so that's another, another, that's another direction, direction that, 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 that people maybe be interested in going, going and where the, 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 the mix of science, science and policy that we provide is useful. useful. And then just, just uh, I'm trying to think of all, I mean, there's, there's a whole whole set of options. Um, and and one, one thing that we can do is, uh, you know, if, if people have particular inter interests, we can try to put you in touch with alums who are in that area. Um, but 
Essentially, right now, it seems like the environmental field is a, is a growth field, uh, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of need for environmental mitigation and, and improvement. But it's also, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating place to be. I, I, I love working in the environment because because it allow, because it requires you to know a lot about a lot of different things, right? So every day is going to be different. We have a um, an alum who is um, uh, who, who, who trying to think of exactly his job title, whether he, but anyway, he, he essentially runs the environmental um, side of an, of an environmental consulting firm here in town, um, Barker Lamar. And, and he came and talked to our class and you know his point was, every day I wake up, I go into the office and I have a totally, diff, a totally new problem. So that, that I have to figure out how to solve, and and he loves it because you know it's never dull. I mean, sometimes it's it's uh, overwhelming because you got to know a whole bunch of things, you got to figure out how to do a whole bunch of, of things. But but at the end, it's really satisfying because there's there's such a range. We have former students working in national parks and in various, you know, as Dave said, consulting firms. Uh, we have students working in the whole policy field of is as consultants to governments, working some with lobbying firms. Um, they the, the need for people to know something about the connection between humans and the environment and the, the legal system is growing all the time. And so if you look at the list of where our alumni are, they are in fact all over the place. And, and the degree seems to prepare people to, to have a variety of choices when they finish. And that's one of the very exciting things about it. And another neat thing about Drake is that we have a mix of sort of a liberal arts program in our university, but also uh, professional schools. And what that means is we have a lot of dual majors. So, for example, we have people who are interested in environmental education um, or uh, or education in, say, high school, um, elementary school, middle school. Uh, and and, and, and so they, they find that, that there, 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 there are a few ways, ways that you can get kids excited about science more, more easily than, um, you know, Take, take them to the screen and start talking about the processes, processes there, there and so on. So, so environmental science is a really important piece of environmental education. So we have students who are either interested in sort of public outreach and so are working in environmental education or else are interested actually in education and want the, the environmental piece. So we have double majors there. We also have a lot of students in, in um, uh, say, say environmental, environmental um, uh, Journalism. journalism, because we because we, because we have, we have a journalism school, school. And, and, it's and it's not just, just journalism, it's not just writing about about, about, about environmental issues, issues which again is a, is a big area, area in journalism. But it's, but it's also, also things, things like marketing and you know green marketing, marketing and that sort of thing. thing. Uh, uh, we, we also have, have the business school, and so uh, that's where a lot of the sustainability uh, pieces come in, where you can you can mix your um, uh, mix a, a degree in environment with some. Uh, entrepreneurial skills and, and you know start up a business or something along those lines. So uh, you know it just there's there's a real variety because there's just a real need for uh, environmental professionals these days uh, out in the workforce. And what you see here is uh, it looks weird because they're all looking the other way. But anyway, they're 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 um, burning a prairie, uh, or actually it's a more savanna area. And, and essentially here in the Midwest, most of our ecosystems. Uh, are sort of habitat, I'm sorry, are, are fire um, adapted. So, you know, you used to have either uh, people intentionally starting fires, so so Native Americans intentionally starting fires for hunting purposes or other things, um, or else lightning strikes and so on. So, that, so, so once we split things up, um, uh, we lost fire in our ecosystem. And so one of the things we train our students to do is to just burn the hell out of stuff. Um, <laughs> and it's actually a good thing in terms of uh, in terms of keeping the habitat healthy. When you put it that way, it sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, it's fine. Katie, but, uh, let me take a shot at your question. Um, we haven't recently had a lot of students going to the Peace Corps. It's certainly something that you could do, and, it's, and the, the environmental science major especially gives you a set of skills that would be really useful in a lot of places the Peace Corps works. Um, you know, we'd be happy to work with you on that if that's something that you'd like to do. But the honest answer is we haven't had very many students who've said that they wanted to do that lately. And so I can't point you to a particular alum who's done it. I just know that it's it's certainly possible. And I, I know people in other contexts who've taken an environmental science degree and gone into the Peace Corps and, and actually had a really good experience and have been very valuable in the work they did there. And I should, and I should say, say, actually, um, um, a student who uh, sort of got excited, excited about, about, about studying about, 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 on the um, one of my 
uh, trips down to Central America has uh, is, is now in Peace Corps. So if, if you shoot me an email, and I will and I'll type it in right now, but um, uh, shoot me an email and and remind me, and I will see if I can get you in touch with her, and she'll she can give you a sense of sort of how she feels Drake prepared her for the Peace Corps. Uh, it's a really neat. I mean, it's 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 a highly competitive program. But it's also they they got this spectacular you know alumni network and so it's a neat a neat thing to to have to have done. Um, you want to take a shot at Alex's question, Dave? Yeah. So essentially, I wish I, I unfortunately don't have a curriculum up on PowerPoint. But essentially, if you're looking at environmental science, you're going to take a core of um, environmental science courses. So you're going to be taking um, biology. Chemistry, uh, semester of chemistry, intro environmental science, environmental sociology, GIS, which is that mapping program I told you about, and then we have a sophomore level, um, a sophomore level uh, case study class where we're, we spend the semester looking in real depth into three case studies: one international, one in Colorado, and one here in in Des Moines. Um, and the idea there is that we really want students early on to get a sense of what um, what kinds of questions they should be thinking about in college um, by looking at the kinds of problems that they're going to need to solve when when they leave here. So that's that's the core. And then depending on whether you're going science track or policy track in in the I'm sorry, science, uh, whether you're going um, conservation track or hydrology track, uh, from your questions, it seemed like you're probably, oh, actually, Alex, I haven't, I haven't asked you because you, you came in a little bit later, um, what sorts of things you're interested in. Um, so I'll start, so, so let me know what you're looking at in the chat window, but I can start by saying the, the um, uh, conservation track is going to get you spend uh, we just changed our curriculum recently, but you spend a. Oh yeah, I should I should point out while while we're looking at some of these other pictures that um, while we spend a lot of time uh, you know doing you know invasive species removal and so on, we also get a chance to uh, uh, hang out and do a lot of us with some of the well, with, as, as you saw in the other one, um, um, some some baby, baby seals, seals and some sea lions actually, actually, actually and, and some uh, giant, giant tortoises. tortoises. We also go. Uh, Snorkeling, snorkeling with uh, some sea, sea turtles, turtles and sharks. Sharks, um, sharks, sharks, sharks because they only eat uh, uh, between six, six p.m. and six a.m. Um, um, anyway, anyway, so, so uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true because they eat at night, and it's uh, it's right on the equator, so it's actually it's meaningful. Um, so let's see. Oh, so the coursework. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you're going to be taking a good chunk of field science classes where you're going to be out in the field working on, um, uh, you know, learning how to do habitat management, learning how to do, you know, learning how to identify species and so on. You're going to take some science and policy integration classes where we delve into sort of the deep science and deep policy of uh, some of the issues that were like climate change, um, water resources, those kind of things. Uh, all of our students take a capstone class where we work on a project that is um, sort of th th that's needed by an external stakeholder. So students in, in so, so essentially people come to us because they've had a lot of good experiences with our students and they say, uh, you know, here's here's a project that that we would love to have somebody do. Um, and, and then we do it and students get uh, hands on experience. They get work experience, they get connections, and they, they learn how to solve a problem sort of from those, from those uh, start to the end. And those projects are widely varied. So this year we have students who, well, one group is trying to determine um, uh, optimal habitat for brown quails in, I guess all quails are brown, I don't know. Um, for, 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 I'm, I'm the computer guy, but anyway, for, for quails in um, uh, in the area where we don't have many of them, there's another group that's that's determining um, the populations of pheasants and wild turkeys in in Chichaco, which is 
you know, it, it's a more complicated problem than, than it might sound in terms of because you can't actually count them all. So you have to find ways to estimate and, and so on. We have some um, uh, trail cameras and some other remote equipment that, that certainly helps with some of that. Um, in the past, that one I was telling you about those grants that students got, those were uh, senior capstone projects. Uh, we have had students work on habitat conservation plans for, uh, we have a, an area here called Four Mile Creek, which is something that, that you guys will be working on in your uh, sophomore level class if you come here, the, the, um, the uh, sophomore case study class. The, the case study will essentially involve, you know, what will we do at Four Mile Creek? And it's a really important question here in Des Moines because essentially we've had a whole bunch of flooding. Uh, we, between development and climate change, uh, we have, here in Iowa, we've had uh, a rash of, of 500 year, or 100 year, 500 year floods in, in a number of, so 93, 2008, 2010, 2013, all had, had record floods in parts of the state. Um, and now we're safe here on, at Drake because we're up, we're up in, on a hill, but uh, certainly parts of the city are not safe. Um, and so one of the areas around Fort Mile Creek, they, they were getting flooded so much that essentially uh, the city and county are buying out a whole slew of homes and, and removing them. So there's all this new open space, uh, and we've got to figure out what to do. And so, well, you know, what to do with it. And so they're coming to us because they know that, you know, we, we have some good expertise and there are just a whole lot of levels to work on on that project. And so um, that's another thing. So, so uh, we've had students look at economic development, some of the policy, you know, some of the students on the policy side. Um, we've, we've had students develop environmental uh, education projects and so on. But the main piece there is that someone comes to us and says we need this figured out and we can't do it ourselves and so you know we get our students to do it for them and it's great experience for the students and it's great uh, you know, for the local uh, community as well one of the things that's characteristic of environmental science is that you end up working on what i call big messy problems where there are lots of people who have a stake in the outcome where the answer isn't obvious you can't just say we'll do it this way and expect everybody to agree with you and so you have to develop the work with people who don't start out in the discussion agreeing with each other. And the sophomore level problem solving class is, is the first introduction to that. And the capstone is the, the, the final exercise in that where you are, you're going to be working on a big messy problem of some sort where the answer matters and a lot of people are going to be affected by it. And if, this is not a make work exercise. This is not a made up laboratory. This is a world problem and you're going to be out in the real world solving it. That's a tremendously attractive credential for graduate programs and for employers because they know that you've actually done this sort of work. You haven't studied how one might do it. You've actually done it. And that turns out to matter a lot. Now, I, I think probably we've used up enough of people's time. So unless there are additional questions, um, I, I think we should probably start letting people head out. Um, Michael, before, oh, before we end, let me, just, let me just say one more thing because to Alex because I forgot to, uh, I talked about the life science, but Alex is interested in sort of engineering and that sort of direction. I want to let you know that our um, uh, hydrology uh, track, that, that's going to be focused, your classes are going to be much more in hydrology, geology, water resources, and chemistry. And so you're going to get, in that class, you're going to, or sorry, in that in that curriculum, you can learn much more about sort of how to work with with water systems um, and so on. So I, I, I just before before he took off, I just wanted to answer that quickly. But yeah, it's true. We've, we've you know spent a fair amount of time. So while we're happy to, to answer questions as long as people want, um, please uh, feel free. One of the things that we want to do here at Drake is be available to you, right? A lot of people, a lot of especially prospective students, they they get intimidated. Um, by us, let us demonstrate to you um, that that you know we want to be working with students. So send us emails, ask us questions, uh, and we would love to love to um, you know, get those answered for you so that you can make the right choice. It's important that you make the right choice for yourself. And if that's not Drake, you know we we will have no hard feelings and wish you all the best of luck in your new school. Um, but we want to make sure you know what's available here and what resources we can bring to the table and, and what kind of an experience we can give you. 
so that if you decide to come to Drake, you can hit the ground running and take advantage of all those resources that are there. So we'd like to encourage you to come to campus. Um, the, the thing that really gives you the most realistic sense of what your life would be like as a Drake student is if you can come see it. And we have three specially scheduled days for admitted students, which you all are, um, so that you can come and talk to people, talk to current students, get a, a real sense of what the experience is about. If you want to come on some other day, by all means, contact us and we will work it out somehow. Um, but but these are days that we've already got a whole plan set up so that if you come to campus, there, there's going to be a way for you to see pretty much everything you want to see that day. And you know whether it's those days or some other day, please come visit the Drake campus. For one thing, it's really pretty here. It's a nice place. And for the other, I think it'll give you a much more realistic sense of what our programs are so that you'll be able to make a better decision for yourself. What other questions do you have for us before we go? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all very much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. We hope we'll meet you on campus. We hope we'll see you in the fall. And if there's anything else we can do to help you make a good decision for yourself, please let us know. Ben, it looked like you were typing something. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so specifically in environmental science major, your largest class is going to, well, you're, you're going to have three large classes um, probably your first year. So that's, there's going to be um, biology and chemistry, which are going to both be around 100 students. Um, they break them down into, into groups. Um, for, for parts of that and for labs and so on, but but they're going to be large classes. Your intro environmental science class is going to be 40 students, um, more or less. And after that, you're not going to see many classes in our program uh, larger than 20 students. Right now, uh, you know, we have a class with, with eight students in it. We try to keep them a little bit larger than that just so there's more interaction and so on. But uh, your, your, your upper level classes, are generally going to be that size and I just was correcting myself because geology the, the lecture part of geology is probably going to be about 30 students um, there'll be some 25 students you know but, 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 but that's it's it's generally lower level students are going to be or sorry lower level classes are probably going to be 30 to um, uh, 100 in not in environmental science but in the class we make we have you take uh, and then um, in in upper level classes I'd say I aim at 15 to 20. Both Keith and I tend to cap our classes at, at about 13 uh, in many cases because that's how many fit in the van and we spend a lot of time out in the field and if we can't get there we can't do things we need to do. So that gives us a good reason to keep the, the, the class at a particular size and that, that works really well. When there are 12 or 13 students in the class you get to know each other pretty well, you can work in teams and there is no, no excuse in the world for not asking questions at that point because you're right there and you've got sometimes 20 minutes or half an hour between campus and where you're going to do your work for the day. And that's a chance to talk things over, both on the way out and on the way back. And we really like it that way. We think that level of interaction, that level of contact between faculty and students is, is, is how it ought to be done. And because we take people off campus, we have the excuse to say the class shouldn't be any bigger than that. And we take advantage of that. So you, you, you will have real hands-on experiences, both with the content and, and a chance to really get to know the faculty and, and not be a number, but be a real person with us, because we think that's how it ought to be done. We also you also have the opportunity to do uh, independent studies here, and if and every semester, I think each of us have a couple of students um, doing independent studies. So if you want, if, if there's something that you want to learn about, you know that you're excited about, and that you don't have a class in, um, then you can have a class with, with one student in it, or maybe two. Um, um, so so that's that's another option. Okay, any last questions? Going once? <laughs> Thank you very much for spending time with us today. We hope we'll get a chance to meet you soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Bye.